All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Water Resources Research Center Spring Seminar Series once again. Um, maybe some folks, some folks were asking last time about, uh, you know, the geological aspects of fuel transport. So hope you were able to make it here for this talk and maybe have some of your questions answered from last time. Um, so we have uh, Gary Beckett and Iris Vanderzander and they will be presenting on uh, fuel transport considerations in the Hawaiian basalt system. Um, so Gary Beckett was formerly a research associate at San Diego State University, where he worked with Dr. David Huntley on examining and testing multi-phase processes under field conditions. Um, and uh, Dr. Iris van der Zander works at the Hawaii Department of Health and supports the Safe Drinking Water Branch and Hazard Evaluation and Emergency Response Office on the Red Hill Project. Thank you, Carrie, for the introduction. Um, okay, thank you everybody for joining. Um, today, we're gonna talk about um, two important aspects in uh, contamination transport uh, in the Hawaiian basalt system. So it's first of all, we're gonna look at, at the geology and then uh, we're going to look at the um, transport of the fuel itself. Uh, I'm going to start with some pretty basic um, stuff so people can follow along. And Gary Beckett will then get into the more uh, complicated details about models and fluid transport. But I wanted to start uh, to get everybody on the same page with what we actually can see in the field and how complicated fluid transport can be. Uh, my background is uh, I'm a geologist. I'm currently a geologist at the Safe Drinking Water Branch since uh, this Monday. Previously, I was with the DOH here office. Uh, I was also involved in the Red Hill project more mar marginally and looking at uh, some data and, and lab reports, um, but I was part of the team. <clears throat> so the key questions when we are looking at contaminant transport or, or fuel transport in a system, in this case, the basaltic system is um, where is the fuel? How does it move? What happens to it and how toxic it is? Today, we're gonna focus on the two items in the middle. How does it move and what happens to it? Uh, which is all, uh, often referred to as um, the transport and fate. So when you're looking at uh, the geology, it can be very complicated. Um, what I of, often discovered in reports I was reviewing is um, people say when they're drilling somewhere, they're, they're hitting a basaltic rock and refusal is encountered and they assume everything is solid. And in reality, that's not the case. When you take a look at this picture here on the left-hand side, this is what you can see at a typical outcrop in Hawaii um, of uh, basalt. You can see that there is uh, a lot of cracks, which can happen during cooling, cooling cracks, or um, you can have weathering you are creating little pathways, for example, when fluids go there and they can be widened by the fuel transport, or you can have, on the other hand, from the fluids, some minerals coming out and pluck some of these channels up. So uh, first message to take away is basalt is not a solid piece of rock where nothing can go through. There are preferential pathways. Um, what we also see often is something called clinker zones. And uh, what this is here on the left side, you can see it's a zone of rubble that is usually um, below a flow in this case, an AA flow. And that's just part of how the flow moves. It cools on the top and on the bottom. And because it, it is still liquid inside and cools on the top and bottom, you have pieces of rubble breaking off that the flow moves on with time. So 
you have a, a, a network of rubble below the flow where you can have actually a lot of uh, pukas in between where fluids or water or fuel water mixture can uh, move along. But what can also happen is that uh, there is this, this zone can weather and you can have clay minerals develop and the zone can be plugged up. So geology is inherently unfair. <laughs> you cannot really predict what happens and whatnot. And when you go from one area to the next, you move like 10 feet over, you can have a completely different geology. You can have also flow contacts. So when one flow uh, develops, you can have weathering on top, and then the next flow uh, comes and, and moves over it. In between, you can have gaps. And again, along those gaps, you can have fluid transport. Uh, let's go to the different flow types. What we often see is RR flows, and they're typical, pretty massive in the core, like you see here. They're typical, you can identify them by stretched vesicles, um, but you don't see a, a lot of interconnected network of, of uh, vesicles and um, quite a bit of space. However, because they're so massive, you can have cracks developing in between. And again, this is where fluid can move. On the other hand, you can have pahoehoe flows. And those typical shows a lot of vesicles then that can be interconnected or not. Um, those vesicles can act like a quasi sponge. So it can be an important st storage reservoir. And if those vesicles are connected, you can have quite a bit of flow going through it. So pahoehoe flow have quite a bit of potential as storage or transport medium. Let's go to the big features. Um, we can also have lava tubes on different scales. Here on the right hand side, we can see uh, a medium sized lava flow, uh, lava tube. And you can have not only lava flow through it and drain out, afterwards it can stay open and you can have fuel and uh, water transport through these kinds of features. Um, it can be quite large, as everybody knows that visited the uh, uh, Thurston uh, lava tube on a big island. Um, they can, can be small or medium sized, but they can also be filled like in uh, the example on the left hand side. So uh, the message from, from all of this is um, a reminder that when we are looking at models, all these features are very diff difficult to incorporate into models, but we need to be aware that these features exist and how this can influence models. Um, as the next concentration, we, we're going to look at fuel, uh, specifically the, the physical and chemical processes that are involved in fuel or contaminant transport. As everybody knows that has poured some oil on water, they're not supposed to mix. So if this happens, then we shouldn't get fuel in the water, right? You should have basically fuel that shares off the top and that should never ever get anything into the water. So the question is uh, also at Red Hill, does this happen or does this not happen? Um, on, on the bottom here, what can also happen is once you stir such a mixture up, you can get a, a very different um, mixture of fuel and water. You can actually get little bubbles in there or, or a foam type mixture. And that has important um, implications on how the uh, contaminant can be transported in the water. Something like this, for example, can be imagined to happen 
uh, at the red head shaft, when you uh, turn pumps off, uh, pumps on, and, and you stir it, um, this mixture up. So you're training basically the fuel into the water. Uh, another pot potential is the solution. The problem is, uh, as we know, uh, like dissolves in like. So we can usually only dissolve something that is nonpolar into a nonpolar solvent and what something that's polar in a polar solvent. Otherwise, you don't get a homogeneous mixture. Uh, I have some example here of a, a polar compound like water, uh, where you have uh, different polarities. So any compound that has polarity is going to be solved. On the other hand, see here on the right, a nonpolar, you have a hydrocarbon that has no polarity. So how are you going to solve this in there? Um, you wouldn't expect this very much to happen. But one possibility is if you have an alteration of your initial hydrocarbons. So this can happen, for example, during uh, biodegradation, where you are adding oxygen onto compounds and your microbes start munching on, on these compounds. They get smaller and oxygen can be added. What this does is basically it can turn molecule into a solvent which has a polar end and a nonpolar end. And then the worst case, this can lead to nonpolar compounds going into the water because the oxygen can bind to the, the water molecules. Uh, I touched on biodegradation. Let's take a look what can happen. Biodegradation is often uh, very simplified, especially in terms of uh, um, does it not does petroleum naturally degrade? Often it is shown that a hydrocarbon, when bacteria start degrading it, um, turns into water and carbon dioxide. While this might be true, it is not that simple. There are many, many steps that go in between. As you can see, for example, in this formula, um, this is an example compound of hydrocarbons and you're adding oxygen. First of all, nothing is gonna happen if you don't add any activation energy or an enzyme. You have to basically uh, get over an initial activation energy to get the process started. Um, after that, you can at some point get carbon dioxide and water and you're creating energy. This energy can be in the form of heat, which also can be used as a tracer when you have uh, some biodegradation going on in terms of uh, fuel degradation. Um, however, as you can see here on the bottom, oxidation of this compound requires 75 uh, electrons and, and therefore it's, it's not a very simple process. These electrons have to move around. So, The process is much more complicated. Um, you can, you ha can have different types of degradation. You can have aerobic degradation where you utilize oxygen, or you can have anaerobic degradation of different com uh, compounds and with different electron ac acceptors. It depends very much on what conditions you have present in the site. Do you have enough oxygen? Do you don't have enough oxygen? After a while, you're depleting the oxygen, even if it is present, and you have to go to other uh, electron acceptors. But what is also important is the process that I showed in the beginning, we're going to CO2 and water, involves many steps in between. And along this pathway, you can have many intermediate compounds, which might be polar compounds uh, that Barbara Beacons 
talked about um, the other day. Um, there can be ketones, alcohols, um, and so forth. So the reaction is not necessarily complete and we don't necessarily know what happens in between. In addition, um, biodegradation happens in competition, but also centropic. So different populations of bacteria can work together or they can work against it, each other and take uh, important components away. Okay, so in summary, weathering of hydrocarbons is a multi-step process. Um, we also can have different um, microbes degrading at different rates. Um, anaerobic degradation like methanogenesis is uh, usually pretty slow. If you have oxygen involved, it can be faster, but all of this depends also on uh, do you have the right substrate um, there that the microbes can use to, to, to um, degrade the fuel? Um, you require to have microorganism present. And um, you can also produce oxygen containing products, as I showed earlier. You can uh, create so called solvents that might be able to pull uh, fuel compounds that are normally nonpolar into a um, polar solvent like water. So they act like a solvent. Biodegradation also depends on many factors, such as you have to have void water available. Um, you need to transport these substrates for the different microbes from one place to the other. You have to have the right substrate there, for example, uh, um, iron reducing microbes need iron, then you have the sulfate reducing microbes that require sulfate and so forth. Um, you can have also a variety of compounds in your fuel. So it depends how good these microbes can degrade long chains or, or ch short chains. Uh, it depends on what your combination of microbes are, which do you have present. And then you can have different growth rates, which is not only dependent on your microbes, but also on the availability of uh, food or oxygen. Um, in addition, you have these dy dynamics of your communities of microbes, which can compete or uh, support each other. And last but not least, you have different conditions in the aquifer, such as different oxygen compositions, but also um, the, um, it, it depends on how fast your aquifer moves. These are different models, what can happen in a plume, but what I just um, want to point out, uh, popular concept is right now uh, that you have in the center, you have a methanogenic area where you have anaerobic bacteria because everything else has been depleted, oxygen has been depleted, sulfate has been depleted and so forth. But you can also have degradation happening at the fringes. It is not quite clear how exactly um, degradation happens, but these are two competing models that uh, are here right now and that most people are talking about. This can be used, for example, to identify a source. So if you are looking for a tracer, um, you want to look at uh, methane, for example, that usually tells you where um, most likely your, your source zone is. Takeaway from what I just presented is um, studies have found that hydrology 
uh, affects biodegradation. So if you if you want to have microbes degrade a material, you have to ensure that different um, fuel or different substrate is moved from one area to the next, otherwise your microbes will starve. But the question is, what kind of speed do you need for the, for the transport of these substrates? So it can't be too quickly because then you're washing it basically away, but it also cannot be too slow so that your microbes don't starve. So this is something we are battling with as well. In the end, you have to look at all these different as aspects that I um, just showed. You have to look at the geology. You have to look at, OK, what, how do you transport water, material? Um, how does a compound, uh, compound evaporate? How do different compounds separate from each other based on, uh, for example, their polarity? And you have to all assemble this in a conceptual site model. And the more you know what's going on, the better it is. If you start with assumptions, there's always room for error. Um, so you want to avoid as much as possible that you are making too many assumptions. So you start with a good um, conceptual site model like this, and then you go and start your model. And But you always have to go back and do some ground truthing compared with the actual data. And with that, I'm going to transition to um, Gary Beckett to take it from here. Thanks, Iris. Um, I will uh, start my video for a moment here, but then I'm going to turn it off just to preserve bandwidth and protect everybody's health and safety in the room. So folks, what I'm going to cover is really just a, a very um, high level overview of some of the multi-phase mechanics, how fuel is transported uh, in general, and then more specifically in hard rock environments. And we'll talk a little about Red Hill, but not a whole lot. Uh, this is more generalized and um, I look forward to some questions hopefully at the end. And uh, I, I've tried to keep it as simple as possible, but I think what you'll find pretty quickly is multi-phase processes aren't simple. So with that, let me see if I can share my screen. Does everybody see a slide? Or does anybody not see a slide? Okay. With that, we will continue on. <clears throat> uh, this cup was a, a taken from one of the tap um, water, uh, one of the sinks essentially in the homes that was affected by uh, particularly the November 20th release at Red Hill, uh, Hawaii News <clears throat> took this, but to uh, Iris's point that when things are emulsified, you can actually see it, right? Dissolve phase, true dissolve phase, you can't see. So the problems that happened around that time frame were emulsified product. Um, you know, some of the factors that we'll talk about today are, are you know, specific to geologic context, some are specific to the fluids, the, meaning the fuels, the non-aqueous phase liquids, as we call them. I'll talk a little bit about some observations and complications, and then again, we'll get into uh, some Red Hill observations. Uh, the one thing I want people to take away, and Iris kind of hinted at it, is that you really can't know and describe everything. You can get your arms around the, the general processes. You can understand that there are things like lava tubes and uh, cooling fractures and whatnot that all have an effect, but describing where each one of those things are is, is impossible. So conservatism is important. <clears throat> These are some observations by other folks in literature uh, that pore scale processes are important, really quite important, but you're never gonna see them at a macroscopic scale. Homogenizing that scale can yield some insights, but actually they're quite limited. Uh, many people, myself included, believe that heterogeneity, especially in complex systems like in Hawaii's basaltic aquifers, you just can't model it deterministically. 
Uh, stochastics, meaning statistical approaches should be used or considered. That's abbreviated from Russell et al. That's not uh, a Science Foundation uh, work that's quite good. Um, other interesting things in hard rocks is small volumes of NAPL in fractures and, and void spaces can at times produce significant NAPL heads and cause behaviors in transport and distributions that are not expected. Uh, the presence of potentially mobile NAPL beneath historical groundwater uh, surfaces are also a possibility uh, under certain release and, and uh, driving pressure conditions. That's abbreviated from Paul Hardesty's work uh, some years ago. <clears throat> there, there's some math here, and, and I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail, but it is really useful, especially anybody that's had a hydrogeology class. We know what Darcy's law looks like. So steady state flow is proportional to the hydraulic conductivity, K, and the gradients, I. And the pore velocity is just that divided by the effective porosity towards water, a really simple equation. When you put it into a multi-phase context, same equation, steady state flow of a phase, NAPL, if we were interested in that, is now proportional to the permeability of the soil or the rock materials, but also the relative permeability of those materials towards that NAPL in the presence of water and or air. It's proportional to uh, the fluid density and the viscosity as well. These relationships, particularly the relative permeability relationship, is nonlinear. And in turn, that's related to saturations. And in turn, that's related to capillarity. So there's a lot of interrelationships for how, even in the simplest steady state form of an equation, NAPL might behave. The continuity equation below here takes Darcy's law and says what happens over time and space. It, it's quite a problem to deal with in a, from a modeling standpoint, right? The, the equation is quite easy conceptually, though. It just says on the left-hand side, if there's a change in mass, it has to be equaled by a change in movement of the fluids. And then NAPL transmissivity has become quite popular lately. This is the equation of NAPL transmissivity. So when you hear folks give you a number or say a transmissivity means this or that with respect to NAPL, it really needs to be put in context of each of the individual parameters because it's an integral over the, the uh, area or vertical integral of uh, where NAPL is in the formation. So that's kind of a sidebar. It really doesn't apply too much to Red Hill but it does apply to other sites in Hawaii and elsewhere. And, and folks should really keep in mind that it is not a simple parameter by any means. <clears throat> Some of you have had physics classes may have done this experiment. If you put glass tubes in a water bath, that's what's uh, uh, in a cartoon is shown here. The smaller the diameter of the tube, the higher the capillary rise of water in the presence of a non-aqueous phase fluid. In this case, it could be air or it could be NAPL. Water will rise to an equilibrium in a glass tube in the presence of a non-aqueous phase liquid. So the head here at the high level is equal to the head here. There is no gradient. This is steady state. So, and that's because of the affinity for the poor wall, the glass, and water, uh, and the polarity of water and some other things that we won't get into. But the bottom line is the smaller the aperture size, the harder it is for NAPL to get into it and displace water. <clears throat> the wettability of the fluids is also really important. Um, on the left-hand side is a is sort of a schematic of a pore space. If it's water wet, uh, this, in this case, it's a dense NAPL, but it doesn't really make a difference. It's an oil. The NAPL will reside in the largest fractions of the pore space, the largest pore diameters. But if oil is the wetting phase, it reverses and it becomes present in the smaller portions of either the pore space or in fractures. If it, when oil becomes wetting, it's much harder to get at, if you will, from a remediation standpoint and so forth. <clears throat> 
these, uh, th th this is a bit busy. So all I'm going to have you take away is that the X axis on each of these four charts is log scale. So if we look at the upper left, what this is is, is uh, equivalent to the pressure of oil as compared to water, the capillary pressure, if you will. And these are the um, effective permeabilities towards NAPL in different soil types. But what you see is it covers more than 10 orders of magnitude. That's really the takeaway, that where water flow covers several orders of magnitude because of the multi-phase processes we looked at a minute ago, NAPL spans many orders of magnitude, at least in theory. And, and lastly, if we look at the uh, lower right sketch, again, plotted against uh, equivalent elevation or pressure of NAPL relative to water, you can see that the NAPL transmissivity will be a function both of that pressure between oil and water, and the, um, in this case, the interfacial tensions of the fluids. So the takeaway from all this is, is you can do these kinds of calculations at home if you feel like it, but there's a lot of variability in behaviors because of these contrasts in uh, NAPL properties as a function of capillarity, permeability, relative permeability, and fluid factors. <clears throat> a lot of folks think about residual saturation, that fraction of oil that gets trapped in the pore space as being a constant. In other words, hey, the residual saturation in that sand is 5%. It isn't. Because of hysteresis and other things like that, the residual saturation of oils is a function of either the initial saturation of those oils plotted on the y-axis versus the, um, I'm sorry, the initial is on the x-axis versus the final on the y-axis, or similarly, a function of pressure. Said in another way, more, much more simply, if you inject oil at a high pressure into a material, it'll have a higher residual than if you put oil in at a low pressure. And from a release context, what that means is the style and character of a release and the pressures generated during that release will dictate not only how much gets into the fractions of the pore space that will see oil, but also what the residual will be. So it's not a constant, it's, it's a variable in itself. Can't be measured in the laboratory as a single number. <clears throat> This chart's a bit busy, but it's actually quite easy when you divide it up. So on the top is a sandy material and on the bottom is a silty sandy material. Obviously, these are not basalts. These are uh, um, more simplified sedimentary lithologies. And then we've got three different NAPL types. We've got a gasoline, a diesel, and an oil. That's the same for both of the soil types and a large, medium, and small spill. So it's just kind of broken up by that. And in, Quite intuitively, large spills go a lot farther than small spills. And large spills of, of things like oil will go much uh, less distance laterally than the same exact volume for something like gasoline. However, because the oil is trying to equilibrate um, and cannot spread laterally to equilibrate as quickly as say gasoline, it penetrates much deeper into the formation, all other things being equal. Uh, the other thing, the, the, the reason zero is in the middle is because for any release on almost any groundwater gradient in normal senses, there is both what you would think of as up gradient and down gradient flow of the NAPL. In other words, the water gradient is not sufficient in most cases to strongly influence uh, most releases, the exception being the very smallest releases. So, a phrase that we often hear, you know, NAPL is down gradient. If somebody means gradient with respect to the water table, chances are they're not thinking about it holistically enough. <clears throat> this is an interesting experiment done a long, long time ago by uh, Rick Johnson at, at Oregon Graduate Institute. It's been repeated many times by others, but uh, <clears throat> it's the issue of homogeneous materials and yet heterogeneous behavior of NAPL. So, here are the measurements downward of NAPL spilt into a uniform sand tank. So at eight centimeters, uh, the, the circle is sort of like what you would see in a, in a core sampler. So you see a lot of NAPL in the core sampler. You move over 
one to the right, you see at 10 centimeters, there's still lots of napple, but your core sampler is not seen very much of it. And by 15 centimeters, which is roughly, I don't know, I can't do the math in my head, six inches or so, you actually see no napple in the sampler. This is in a sandbox. So I'll let people in the room take their own guesses at what you think napple distributions in a hard rock setting that looks like what Iris showed earlier might actually look like and the challenges in describing that. This is uh, probably some of the best work ever done in NAPL uh, research. Um, it's so old now that a lot of folks have forgotten about it, but, but um, John Wilson at New Mexico Tech and his colleagues did a lot of experimentation, both with models that were constructed, but also with uh, uh, sands and other materials. So starting at the top, this was, this was oil injected into a water wet uh, pore network that is uh, designed based on a fracture network. And then to the right of that is the residual oil in that network after they drove water through and drove as much oil out as they could. And what you see is a really highly heterogeneous distribution. So you could put a number on this, whatever that is, 2%, 3%, but it's not uniform in its distribution by any means. And this is, an, again, a simplified uh, man-made model. Uh, these blobs below are just actual blobs in a sandy porous medium. These are the, what the residual oil looks like in uh, a sediment. Others like Geller and, and his colleagues actually built a model of a fracture. They did this by injecting uh, liquid metal into a fracture and then with geophysics and some imaging, were able to make a model of the fracture. And then they injected water and napple into the fracture and looked at the distributions. And unfortunately, it, my recollection is that oil is actually blue and water is red, but it, it really doesn't make much difference in the sense that even in a single fracture, it is virtually impossible to describe the distributions of oil and water, meaning in a forward sense, how would I predict where these things would be? And where there's continuity, what we call phase continuity, oil connected to oil, there's mobility where there's phase discontinuity, there's immobility. So even in a single fracture, these are the complications that you might expect. There's a lot of different ways to look at different geologic systems and model them, both with respect to groundwater, contaminant transport, NAPL transport. I'm not gonna go through all these. <laughs> it can be simple on the upper left and it can be highly complicated on the lower right. But like I said earlier, stochastic methods tend to be one of the norms. If you have enough information, you could do things like discrete fracture networks and other types of things. You can also do scaling parameters and other stuff that I'm not gonna get into, but the bottom line is you have to have a way to wrap your arms around the complexity of the system that you're dealing with. This is just some incredible work uh, that Don Reeves and some others at, at DRI did. Uh, these are all the fractures in a uh, hard rock setting that they mapped out. The yellow plane is what you're now looking at below. The left hand uh, figure is all the fractures in that plane. The right hand is just the fractures that are interconnected. So what you see is there's a scaling. First, the scaling is now you've gone 2D, right? And now you have all these fractures in just that single 2D plane but only this much smaller fraction of those fractures are at play in a hydraulic uh, continuity setting, if that makes sense. Um, a little more math, but I'm not gonna go into it at high length, but it, fractures don't behave like porous media. They can be approximated sometimes, but that's really not what the theory or experience supports. And so if we look at bulk flow Q, this is the permeability term, the effective hydraulic conductivity term that we looked at earlier. In this case, with simple fractures, it's a function of the cube, cube of the aperture um, width. For more real fracture settings, Klimczak and others suggest that it's to the fifth power. So 
Complex Darcy flow like we looked at before is even not complex enough, if that makes sense. Plus, even beyond this, this is again, just experimentation and other work that says through apertures and fractures, NAPL and other fluids can move very quickly. If the fracture aperture is big enough, you can also get film flow. Think, think about how oil spills propagate um, in the open ocean, open water. Film flow is a real thing for NAPLs. Uh, switching over to sort of more Hawaii specific then, uh, you know, this experiences that we've all uh, seen and, and I, I think I saw Bob uh, Whittier log on here. Bob and, and some others have lots and lots of experience with this. Typically move quickly and in complex pathways. Fast track and other geologic features exist. Um, Iris did a good job covering those. They may have a sparse distribution but that doesn't mean they don't have a very large effect. Uh, the weathering of the rock is complex too. So even though I may have a clinker zone, as Iris pointed out, that clinker zone may be completely different 50 feet away from another location, even though they're both clinker beds. One may be weathered with clays and uh, pore space that's uh, occluded and the other may be open and quite permeable. <clears throat> So, you know, our questions for Red Hill and other places like it in the state is, how is that architecture arranged? How will the fuel behave within that? Effects of, um, of those things on capture and remediation of fuels. And, and of course, all those relate then to groundwater protection goals and, and so forth. Um, these are some core photos that were done uh, at the Red Hill facility. This is from the uh, redacted Navy CSM. These are really beautiful quality core photos. But the thing I will point out is, I mean, there's a lot that can be learned from them, don't, don't get me wrong, but this is testing the rock body, if you, that makes sense, not the transport pathways. The transport pathways are the things like the fractures or the open pore space or other features like um, uh, Iris was talking about. But you can learn a lot from these cores and, and, the, and they were beautifully done, they uh, really were. But one of the things that we noticed, um, and, and this is often true, not just at Red Hill or in Hawaii, but everywhere that we, we look, there are field and lab scale issues. And this though is, is a calculation set that's done specifically uh, for the Red Hill area where the blue and the red uh, permeabilities in Darcy's are based on field scale measurements. You can see that no matter whether you look at the geometric mean or the average, the median or the max, they're all around the same order of magnitude. But when you look at the uh, uh, permeability from the petro, uh, petrographic lab, they span a lot more orders of magnitude. But the one thing that they all have in common is they're, they're quite a ways, several orders of magnitude away from the field scale permeabilities. And since we're interested in the features that transmit fluids, water, oil, air, um, those are the things that we need to understand. Uh, another uh, figure from um, the Navy's work in the conceptual model is sort of some three-dimensional renderings of uh, the barrel logs. These were the logs that were taken when the Red Hill tanks were put in. Uh, Stearns and others sort of directed the work um, and, uh, and it's great work. It's, it's one of the few places probably in the world because Red Hill itself is such a unique engineering marvel where each of these 20 tanks, some person was able to, to look around 360 degrees and geologically log these really enormous holes. So you can see that, you know, there are things like loose rock and lava tubes were recognized and clinker zones and all these other features. And, you know, if you talk about the lava tubes in red, even though there are not very many of them, they are certainly present. And this is a, a cross section from the same work. <clears throat> and, and all I'm really pointing out here is that even when you simplify the cross sections, which, which all of us necessarily have to do as geologists, that's nothing unusual. But, but the, the things that are important are the way these bridging zones and other features where lava flows stop or other um, types of behaviors during uh, the volcanic flows, how these are interconnected vertically. Because in a very simple way, we know that rainfall percolates and recharges our aquifers in Hawaii. That's, that's a good thing. That's why our water is so good here. Um, and so there are ways for fluids to get down and where those features are is, is really quite important. 
uh, Dr. Roland at UH, uh, some of you may know, but you know, really did some very nice work. Um, before I get into his work on, on the upper right, is sort of a schematic of the kinds of features in hard rock systems that we're interested in knowing about. And what Dr. Roland did is he went out to an outcrop uh, near the Red Hill area and mapped out uh, the different types of lithologies that are there, and then mapped out sort of how the poor features in those lithologies distribute themselves. So on the lower right is, is that schematic. It's that, and that, you know, that's just a one face in two dimensions, right? So this captures a sense for the complexities of how fluid behavior might be influenced, and in, in, in particular, uh, NAPL behavior might be influenced by the characteristics of these features, how often they occur, uh, where they are, the uneven nature of the lower surfaces of these features. All of those things will have an effect on how uh, both water and fuels behave. So <clears throat> there, there's a couple ways of, well, there's more than a couple, but there are many ways of looking at, at different aspects of, of the fuel behaviors. Um, in the CSM, the Navy had a fuel holding model, and, and this is based on uh, some of the older work because it's, it's simple to view, not that it, it doesn't update the reflect the, the modifications and other things, but essentially a holding model just says fuels can be retained at some residual based on the type of lithology that they pass through. And so uh, the holding model was built out of a number of lithologic layers with different residual capacities. And out of those came numbers. And um, uh, there was a, in some of the uh, public domain documentation, there were some estimates of what safe release volumes might be based on a holding model approach. What we've been interested in from a technical basis is, is more of the dynamics. And so what you're gonna see here is something we've shown at several work groups before, but we'll show again. These are actually dynamic models of NAPL uh, movement through time. We're at 50 minutes so far. Don't worry, it won't, won't, won't last several years as it seems to be implying it'll get done pretty quickly. But the middle one is, is probably closest to what happened uh, in November around uh, the Adit 3 tunnel and so forth. It, a sudden release of NAPL into the ground uh, the colors represent different lithologic characteristics. Obviously, a sudden release builds up higher pressures, causes things to behave differently than chronic releases on the right or small releases on the, uh, on the left. And as things move forward in time, you saw that I stopped it there, that, that a dynamic model suggests that on the order of days, I think it was seven or 10 or whatever, Napple on a, on a sudden release had the potential to reach the water table. You'll notice as time goes on that the Napple continues to drain from the formation at some rate based on all those different properties that we looked at earlier. Um, so, you know, the moral of the story is, is even this modeling, which by the way, is not based on site specific parameters because we don't have those for the multi-phase environment. Um, even so, scenario building uh, suggests that, you know, these are the kinds of behaviors that we should be on the lookout for uh, in the case of fuel releases. So, you know, all of that, uh, hopefully for, especially for a, a, a broad-based science group, like I think most of the people are here, although I, I, I don't know everybody and I don't have a list in front of me, but I think maybe the takeaways are fairly um, straightforward. The fuel mechanics, the way fuels move is complex got not only the physical aspects, you have the chemical aspects, biologic aspects that uh, Iris was talking about. The other interesting thing that we're not gonna talk about is when you make polar hydrocarbons through degradation, you also create a surfactant effect that typically lowers the interfacial tension between oil and water and changes the way oil behaves. So, um, you know, fuel transport itself in hard rock settings, and, and this setting is no different, itself can be a primary risk driver. In other words, uh, secondary transport in water uh, is usually more limited and uh, between dispersion, degradation, other factors. So often NAPL is the source for the impacts that we're concerned about. Again, NAPL is the same as fuel uh, to folks like me that work in this, this end of the field. <clears throat> the parameterization of hard rock systems is incredibly difficult. Um, nobody, nobody would even uh, begin to say it's easy. But the starting point is not really in the lab, at least in my experience. It's, it's 
old fashioned geology, starting with mapping like Dr. Roland showed in that example earlier. Um, and due to all those uncertainties, modeling itself is non-deterministic, but that doesn't mean that key processes and accounting for key features, geologic and otherwise, uh, can't be looked at, investigated, so that useful modeling can be, can be created to explain whatever observations you're interested uh, in looking at. So I, I think that's, that's it, if I'm not mistaken. All right, um, thank you very much for both of you. Um, really great talks, a lot of valuable information. I think uh, a lot of people are really interested in hearing about that. Um, we've already got a couple of questions in the chat, um, but the audience is welcome to continue adding a few more. Um, so let's get started with the questions then. So the first one I got was from Eric Mead. Um, they say, do we have the details on how all this great information is being or not being used in the various modeling that is being done, specifically the modeling the Navy is using? Um, that's a question you, unfortunately, you'd have to ask the Navy. I don't know in full what they've been done. Certainly these processes, areas of, of interest and concern have been discussed in uh, over several years, in fact. Uh, next question from Lily Bowie. Um, is there anyone here working with mod flow to look at Red Hill scenarios? I'm sorry, I saw, I'll pick it up just because <laughs> Iris uh, has uh, stepped out of the Red Hill um, work. And so maybe I'm a little more current with it. But um, yeah, mod flow is the platform that the Navy and its contractors are using for um, the Red Hill aquifer system, that portion of it. Um, and um, and they're, they're currently in uh, the phase of doing some modifications with it. And th th there's been a number of iterations using the ModFlow platform. Okay, and then there's a question from Aurora Kagawa Viviani. Um, this is for Iris. Uh, what is known about contaminant discharge to surface waters in the area around Red Hill, given many springs? Well, all I know is at, at this point, we don't have any indication that there is uh, any contamination uh, in that scenario, um, especially when you look at, at Halava Stream, um, there's no indication. And actually, um, the stream is situated um, above the water table, so there is no real um, hydraulic connection to, to get the contamination in there. I'll, I'll add just a touch to that. I mean, we've noted in the data themselves, um, things like dilution and, and buffering and, and so forth. So it, it is a complicated system, but there uh, do seem to be some, uh, you know, inherent buffering features. Uh, like for instance, uh, you know, quite a, kind of surprising, but the, um, uh, the Red Hill shaft still, still has small amounts of free product fuel in it, and yet pumping at a laminar flow, as has been uh, going on since uh, January, I believe, um, you know, the influent detections in the water itself are, are quite low to non-detect. Um, so that, that's good news. Uh, one more question from Ali al Qadi. Uh, are you are you talking about stochastic transport processes or geological features or both? Um, well, <clears throat> so the stochastic processes, Ellie, it, we're talking about ways of <clears throat> embedding the geologic features into modeling. Uh, that's one way of doing it, uh, for sure. But the way a modeling can be done a number of different ways, as I showed in that one slide, and certainly you, you of all folks know that. So, you know, for instance, it can be done with scaling uh, parameters. So if, if one had a good basis, statistical or otherwise, to, if you remember the fracture models that I showed uh, from Dan Reeves, um, 
you know, you could say, okay, only 10% of the pore space is interconnected here. So despite having an effect of a field-based porosity of say, you know, whatever it is, 15% or 10%, the effective flow pathways are in fact 2% and all of my um, flow and other parameters need to be scaled accordingly. That's just one example, but uh, so there's a number of different approaches. Okay, um, don't see any more questions. Oh, <laughs> Aurora slipping in with one more. Uh, for Gary, uh, does this suggest macro poor preferential flow are dominant processes um, regarding Red Hill field scale, field scale versus lab scale? And in this context, what is the right scale to assess and monitor at? Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's a great question. I, I mean, these kinds of systems are, are typically dominated by macro pores. Uh, now, for um, the basaltic system, you know that kind of behavior is different for each of the various zones. So, for instance, if you're in the clinker zone, um, you know whether or not there's there's uh, weathering and occlusion of the pore space and so forth that's one type of macro pore system. So not so if the average porosity of the clinker zone is 35% or whatever it is, not all of that 35% is engaged across even a given single uh, lithologic unit, at least most likely. Um, but then, then that's different than the way the uh, uh, core would behave, where as Iris mentioned, there are cooling fractures. And if I remember right, you know, it's roughly uh, five or so percent plus or minus um, the, the initial volume of the material is, is what the cooling fractures typically are. But the point being is that if you have a very slow cooling uh, uh, core, that's gonna have a different set of fractures than if it's a thin, fast cooling uh, uh, core. And so not all of the fractures within a given um, bed, even a single bed, will behave in the same way. So for a small spill, the big fractures are gonna transmit for a large spill where there's enough pressure built up, more than the big fractures would become involved. That's a long answer and probably doesn't even start to answer your question. But uh, Followed up with uh, any thoughts on how to sample, monitor strategically to really capture the effects of what might be happening in the subsurface? Yeah, so, <clears throat> There, there are um, some ways, that, I mean, everything is a bit difficult, but um, we have been uh, talking with the Navy and the Navy has been responsive, looking at uh, what are called in-well tracer tests and some other characterization techniques. Uh, you can take those kinds of techniques to a, a larger scale, more of a field scale. Uh, there are some downhole geophysical techniques and others that can help us as well. Um, there are vapor tracers that can be used that have partitioning characteristics that some have an affinity more for water say than they do for napple and so i at least my own thought is that it needs to be um, a multi-pronged investigation to get a holistic understanding of, of system behaviors and iris you may have quite a bit to add on that no i was just gonna say uh if you listen to bob um, what years uh, uh, presentation last time they were talking about actually uh, about looking at these tracer tests. So I think that that is a perfect way to uh, to to start ta tackling the issue. Okay, I think we can wrap it up here. Um, so I just want to extend a big thank you to both of our speakers for joining us in this series. I'm really glad to have you.